Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Michael Mann, a distinguished professor of atmospheric science at Penn State, with joint appointments in the Department of Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. He has received many honors and awards, including the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration's Outstanding Publication Award. Selection by Scientific America as one of the 50 leading visionaries in science and technology. And additionally, he has contributed with other IPCC authors to the award of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. And in 2020, he was elected to the United States National Academy of Sciences. He's the author of numerous books, including Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, Dispatches from the Front Lines, and The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. And his latest book just out is The New Climate War, The Battle to Take Back Our Planet. Welcome to Background Briefing, Michael Mann. Thank you, Ian. Always good to be with you. Well, thanks for joining us. And the old climate war is the 30-year-long war waged by fossil fuel companies and their enablers to deflect blame and to delay action on climate change. And in effect, their tactic has been to emphasize the individual responsibility, individual behavior like recycling, and thus placing the responsibility for fixing climate change on the shoulders of the individual, not those that create the pollution and the problem in the first place in the way that the gun industry have deflected blame with their slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Do you think that that battle is over, Michael? No, so that's uh, what I actually characterize as the new climate war. Um, the, the old climate war is really the effort by fossil fuel interests, um, you know, as you're describing, to discredit the science, to literally deny the reality of climate change. And that war, I argue, is over because it's been won by Mother Nature. Um, and I don't really have to convince Californians, uh, you know, who are listening to this interview about that. The record wildfires that California has seen, uh, the bushfires that I saw in Australia when I was in sabbatical down there last year, the hurricane season we had uh, this year in the Gulf Coast, um, the literally the unprecedented onslaught of uh, devastating extreme weather events that have sort of communicated to the public the reality of climate change and makes it very difficult for talking heads to claim it isn't happening because people can see it with their own two eyes but you know they haven't given up the fossil fuel interests who continue to make record profits all they care about is that we remain addicted to fossil fuels they don't care it's whether we deny that climate change is real or that we simply don't act for an array of other reasons. And so they've moved on to these other tactics to try to block any meaningful action. And that includes, as you say, sort of deflection from individual behavior, which is important, but they've tried to characterize or frame that as the solution, when in fact we need policies, we need systemic changes, we need incentives for renewable energy, price on carbon, uh, all of these things that they don't want to see happen that are critical if we're to make this transition. That's just one of a number of tactics that they are using in this new climate war. So one of the few, <laughs> I'm always casting around for something optimistic, Michael, and I've been covering a little bit of what Biden's been doing in these flurry of executive orders. And there is reason to be optimistic, surely, with the GM and car manufacturers making the target of 2035 to have all electric fleets and John Kerry covering the foreign policy side, Gina McCarthy on the domestic side. They seem to be incredibly serious, and Biden himself has labelled climate change as a maximum threat. What yeah. about the national security side of it? Are the intelligence people and the military people making this a priority? I, I think they are. Uh, you know, John Kerry, who is appointed as the special envoy on climate, has a seat on the National Security Council. Uh, we've never had that before. Uh, somebody who is tasked with our diplomatic relationships with other countries um, aimed at achieving meaningful climate action uh, also has a seat on the National Security Council. And that communicates very clearly to the world that we do see this as a security threat and that it will be climate change will be 
absolutely a consideration in our defense policies and how we approach issues of national security and diplomacy. So I think that's a good sign. I think there are, in fact, as you just alluded to, a number of reasons for cautious optimism, you know, with Biden having campaigned on climate, coming in with a mandate to act on climate and signaling very clearly uh, early on that he intends to make good on that commitment um, to his supporters and the American people. And we've seen some real bold action. Um, there are you know, reasons to think that you know, we are at the cusp of meeting this challenge. And really the purpose of my new book, The New Climate War, is to say, look, we're so close now. Um, and the book went to press, of course, before we knew um, that uh, Biden uh, was elected president and would be leading with this bold agenda. But it sort of one could see things moving in that direction. And so the point of the book is we are so close to finally achieving the action that's necessary. We can't allow these few these few obstacles that are being tossed in our way by fossil fuel interests, those promoting their agenda, the inactivists, as I call them, the forces of inaction. Let's recognize their tactics. Let's push back against them. Let's defend against them. And let's continue to move forward. And again, I'm speaking with Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State, with joint appointments in the Department of Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. He contributed with other IPCC authors to the award of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize, and he is the author of a number of books, including Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, Dispatches from the Front Lines, The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics and Driving Us Crazy. And his latest book, Just Out, is The New Climate Wars, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. So let's talk about how you motivate people to recognize this dire threat to the yep. very existence on this planet, or at least the, the way of life that we're used to. And when you think about your children, your grandchildren, I, for one, do wonder about what kind of world it will be yep. just based upon what we've seen so far. And these giant you know, ice sheets breaking up and the forest fires and the, particularly the ones that you witnessed in Australia, Michael. Yeah. It's difficult not to sort of go into doom and gloom, but you don't want to reinforce despair, obviously. Right. And, you know, the forces of uh, inaction, the inactivists have, in, in fact, fanned the flames of doomism, <laughs> uh, uh, you, know, so, you know, oddly enough. Uh, because they realize that, um, you know, if you can be led to believe that it's too late to do anything uh, about a problem, it potentially leads you down the same path of inaction as outright denial. Um, it leads to disengagement. And the inactivists, the fossil fuel interests who are fighting this new war, they don't care about the path you take. They just care about the destination. They just want you disengaged. And fanning the flames of doomism is one of the ways that they've actually done that. Um, in fact, I have an op-ed uh, coming out in The Hill tomorrow morning uh, about this and actually uh, commenting on some uh, recent statements by the former Republican governor of Indiana, Mitch Daniels. And he was recently quoted in the Washington Post saying, if, and he's, he's been a climate change denier in the past, and he's clearly a critic of uh, meaningful climate action. He doesn't want us to uh, decarbonize our civilization. And he, he actually used you know, the argument, he made the claim that, look, these climate models, if we're to believe them, indicate that it's already too late to stop the warming. <laughs> so this really is an argument that's being used by an activists to disable us, to disengage us, and we have to recognize that. And here's the thing, Ian, you know, you, you, you make a, an important point. We are committed to some bad things already, right? Dangerous climate change, in some sense, has arrived if you live in California and you've witnessed the, the, the destruction, the death and destruction of these unprecedented wildfires in recent years, um, and the, the uh, unprecedented droughts that California has had to contend with. Australia, Puerto Rico, which was devastated by an unprecedented storm, and the list goes on. Dangerous climate change has arrived, so we're not going to avoid dangerous and damaging climate change impacts, but we can still prevent the worst from happening, and that's what's so important here. Uh, there is urgency 
um, as I say in the book and in this op-ed, but there is also agency. We can make a difference. And there is a piece of good news from the science over the last decade or, or so as we've done sort of more um, realistic modeling experiments that incorporate the behavior of the ocean and, and plant life when it comes to the global carbon cycle. So we put carbon into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, but the ocean takes carbon out of the atmosphere. The terrestrial biosphere plants take carbon out of the atmosphere. And if you model that system in its entirety, what you find is that if we stop emitting carbon now, yes, there is the continued warming effect of the CO2 we've already put into the atmosphere. We used to call that committed warming, and it made us, it, it led to predictions that we would see continued warming for decades to come. But offsetting that is the fact that if we stop burning carbon, the oceans and the plants uh, continue to take carbon out of the atmosphere and CO2 levels start to drop. And they start to drop in a way that offsets that so-called committed warming effect. So you basically just get a flat line, which is to say, if we stop burning now, burning carbon now, surface temperatures basically flatten out within a few years. We can prevent continued warming up of the surface of the planet. Now, there are other sort of longer legacy components of the system and you allude to the ice sheets and the sea level rise associated with the collapse of the ice sheets some of that may be locked in just from the warming we've already caused so i don't want to be a pollyanna um, there are still some detrimental long-term impacts that are now baked in but we can prevent much of the worsening of the problem by just stopping <laughs> that what's causing the problem which is the burning of fossil fuels so rather than fall for the trap of having the responsibility shift to, to the individual away from those that do the polluting, the fossil fuel industry, yeah. what about the crisis that we're in now with COVID, which will kill you know at least half a million or more Americans thanks to yeah. Trump's incompetence and ignorance? And what's attending all of that, of course, is science denial. Yeah. And, and you're making the opposite case that you have to listen to the science and yeah. the first climate war was about science denial. That one's over. The new one is about shifting responsibility onto the individual as opposed to the polluter. But now we have at least learned some lessons, have we not? The big crisis after this one is solved, and it will, will be solved by science, meaning vaccinations. And maybe people will, will learn a lesson from that to come back to science. But the big one ahead, of course, is climate change. Yeah. So that's the battle ahead. But what do we learn from the current battle? Because just in my own case, Michael, yeah. I have a home studio now from which I'm recording now this right. conversation. And I don't drive in every day on the freeway being stuck in traffic sure. morning and evening, belching pollution into the air in a completely dysfunctional way. And millions and millions of Americans are now using Zoom and other ways to work and telecommute. Yeah. So how much are we learning just as individuals, not in terms of our responsibility, but in terms of that we can actually live a better life without contributing to global warming? Yeah, that's right, Ian. I think there are a number of really important lessons that we can draw from what we've just been through over the last year. And, you know, I don't want to in any way suggest that, you know, it's a positive thing um, that this has happened. Uh, it's a tragic, uh, you know, thing. And as you allude to, because of a president who refused to listen to the word of science, because it, it conflicted with his ideology, his, um, his, his efforts to be reelected, he realized that if we took the actions necessary to, to deal with this threat, he he perceived that it would hurt his reelection um, chances. Probably the opposite was the case. But nonetheless, because of his misguided views, which were guided by ideology and power and maintaining power, we, we lost, a, you know, as you said, the better part of a million lives will likely be lost by the time this is over. And a big part of why is because we didn't listen to what the public health science was telling us, what science experts like Anthony Fauci were telling us. So, you know, one of the things that coronavirus communicates is that science denial is deadly. And we can literally measure that toll in hundreds of thousands of human lives when it comes to the pandemic. But you know what? Climate change will lead to even greater losses of life if we don't do something about it. And so lesson number one, science denial is deadly. And I think the pandemic has taught us that. 
it's also taught us, as you allude to, um, that we do have agency. Once again, we can change uh, our practices and our lifestyles in a way that makes life better for us and, and everybody else. Um, and that's part of the solution. Of course, if you look at you know the 2020 numbers, they will have come down, uh, carbon emissions will come down by about 7%, or that's what the estimates seem to be now. They came down about 7%. Now that's great news, but here's the bad news. We've got to bring them down another 7% next year, and then a 7% beyond that every year for the next decade, if we are to remain on track to reduce our carbon emissions below the levels that will bake in the worst impacts of climate change, more than a degree and a half Celsius or roughly three degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet. To do that, we've got to reduce carbon emissions at least as much as that every year for the next several years. And we've gone about as far as we can go with lifestyle change, voluntary measures. The only way we achieve those deeper reductions is literally by decarbonizing our economy, by decarbonizing society. So yeah, there's sort of a foot in the door and we've seen that we can impact those global carbon emissions, but voluntary measures and lifestyle changes alone aren't gonna be enough. We need systemic change. A little bit of more good news, though, is that we're starting to see that systemic change with the new administration and with a Congress that seems intent on passing meaningful climate action. And let's talk about the hopeful and practical plans that you're putting forth in your book. Um, yeah. A Marshall Plan, taking that as a kind of model, the Civilian Climate Corps. Let's go through some of the the measures that can be taken to mobilize activism yeah. and spread it literally to every corner of the country. Yeah, absolutely. In, uh, in a recent uh, op-ed, I actually used that analogy, uh, the Marshall Plan. You know, in this case, we need to provide resources. We have to help along those communities that are going to be impacted by this necessary transition. We need to transition away from fossil fuels uh, toward renewable energy. But we don't want, you know, people to be left behind. And so we do need programs to go into those communities to try to revitalize them. And that's one of the things I really like about the, the Biden uh, plan or the executive actions that uh, the Biden administration has announced. There are specific programs that they are promoting uh, the funding uh, for that will help, again, fund efforts to revitalize those communities, fossil fuel communities, uh, this civilian climate core, this idea of creating jobs for people who will go out and actually help solve this problem, engaging in practices, forestry practices, um, agricultural practices that are climate friendly and carbon friendly, and who will restore some of the damage that's been done to uh, wildlife, to our environment. And there is this recognition that, that we do have to help people along through this difficult transition, but we need to make the transition. The other thing that it recognizes is the importance of helping out frontline communities, low income uh, minority communities who are often the most impacted by environmental degradation. And they <laughs> typically had the least role in creating the problem. They aren't the major emitters. Um, those with more wealth and affluence are the ones who have uh, produced more of the carbon pollution. So there's a recognition of you know, the importance of uh, climate justice, of recognizing the, the social justice component of uh, what we need to do here. Um, you know, here's the thing. Biden's plan comes about as close to constituting a Green New Deal as you could possibly do with executive actions alone. It goes about as far as the administration can go. To go that next yard, we're going to need legislation to, to complement the executive actions that are being taken, that lock in you know, some of these uh, systemic changes. And that's going to be a battle. But I think now that uh, Democrats control both houses of Congress, I think it can happen. It may come down to using reconciliation and a simple majority of 50 votes and a tie-breaking vote by the vice president to pass climate legislation through, you know, uh, reconciliation. But we're going to get climate legislation that's going to complement the executive actions that have been taken. So that's the path forward. Let's not allow these obstacles that 
The inactivists continue to throw in our way deflection, division, trying to get us to fight with each other so we don't represent a united front demanding change, false solutions like uh, geoengineering. Uh, we can just manipulate uh, our global environment in some other way to offset the warming. Uh, none of these paths forward are productive or safe or sensible. And we have to make sure that we keep our eye focused on the prize, which is making sure that our policymakers support policies that will decarbonize our civilization as quickly as humanly possible. So just in the last couple of minutes, Michael, there is, of course, you mentioned earlier the use of carbon pricing. And obviously, we've lost four years under yeah. Trump. But one of the things that you mentioned is optimistic is that young Republicans are becoming much more aware of the dangers of climate change and the need, yeah. the need to deal with it. So in terms of a broader coalition, are you confident that it can be built? I mean, uh, as I say, I worry about my grandkids, yeah. um, but, you know, the millennials and others like Greta Thunberg are active yeah. and she's endorsed your book, by the way. So yeah. give us a sense just in the last couple of minutes here what, how you see this real critical mass of activism that's necessary. Yeah, I think that's been a game changer, uh, Ian. It really has. Uh, Greta Thunberg, the, the youth climate movement, they've really recentered the conversation where it needed to be all along uh, about the, the ethical quandary of us destroying this planet for future generations and the, you know, the, the, the inequity uh, that those who had the least role in creating the problem are the ones who are already suffering the greatest consequences. And so this really has to be not just about the science and the economics and the, and the policy and the politics, but about the, the fundamental ethics uh, behind our need to, to act. And, and, and these, you know, there has been this confluence of the youth climate movement, um, the, the, the uh, sunrise movement, um, and the social justice and, and racial justice movements that are playing out and, and the intersection between all of them that has really created a very important moment. You know, that moment is here. This is our moment. We can make it happen. And that's the purpose of my book, to make sure we recognize the obstacles that remain and don't allow them to obstruct our path forward, because this is our opportunity now. Well, Michael Mann, I thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, thank you, Ian. Always a pleasure. And again, I've been speaking with Michael Mann, who's a distinguished professor of atmospheric science at Penn State with joint appointments in the Department of Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. He's received many honors and awards, including the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration's Outstanding Publication Award. Selection by Scientific American as one of the 50 leading visionaries in science and technology. And additionally, he contributed with other IPCC authors to the award of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. And in 2020, he was elected to the United States National Academy of Sciences. He's the author of numerous books, including The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, Dispatches from the Front Lines, and The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics and Driving Us Crazy. And his latest book just out is The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters. I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon. And this program is available for podcasting at backgroundbriefing.org, where you can sign up for our email updates as well as subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like this program, you can help us reach more listeners by taking a moment to rate and review us on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please do share the program with friends and family and colleagues on Twitter and Facebook. And to help us sustain our mission and spread the word to keep us corporate free and commercial free, we have added a donate button. So if you're in a position to give support, please take a moment to visit backgroundbriefing.org slash donate where your tax-deductible contributions will help us continue to build a reality-based community in post-truth America. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another background briefing. Bye for now.